Glenn Greenwald brought us the Snowden revelations about the national security state. But secrecy is a bigger problem than one whistleblower and one agency. How does secrecy threaten democracy itself? Welcome to the Henry A. Wallace National Security Forum. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. Perhaps no one has stirred the pot more on the reach of the national security state than journalist Glenn Greenwald when he released information provided by whistleblower Edward Snowden. Americans learned that the NSA was spying on everyone and even sharing that data with other agencies like the DEA. What we want to explore today is not just the programs of the NSA, but how and why secretive programs undermine our democracy. Joining me now is Glenn Greenwald. Welcome to the program, Glenn. Great to be with you. Thank you. So the NSA claims that they are collecting all of this data on all of us with the mandate to keep us all safer. But are they actually accomplishing that? Not at all. I mean, if you look at the successful terrorist attacks like the one that was carried out at the Boston Marathon, it's almost impossible to find any evidence of these NSA programs actually stopping any terror plots. And if you look even going back all the way 10 years ago to the 9-11 Commission, what they concluded about why the U.S. government failed to stop the 9-11 attack was not because they had failed to collect enough intelligence. Quite the contrary, they said that the government had collected more than enough intelligence to be able to know the attack was coming, but that they had, they had so much in their possession that they failed to proverbially connect the dots to know what it is that they had. And their solution or their response to that conclusion was to simply try and collect more. In fact, in the words of the NSA documents, their goal was to collect it all, to collect the entire internet. And as you suggest, when you're collecting everything, it's almost impossible to find the things they claim they're looking for, which are people who are planning terrorist attacks or other violent crime. Now, it's quite widely known that the NSA stores all of the um, massive amounts of data that it collects in certain data centers, for example, in Utah. But doesn't that, uh, just the fact that it's all sitting there in this central location or in a number of central locations, doesn't it result in a risk, particularly uh, in terms of cybersecurity and the threats that uh, these sorts of data centers might be under? It's a really good point, actually, and one that's often overlooked. Um, you know, Edward Snowden was just a single individual who didn't even work for the NSA. He actually worked for an outside contractor, Booz Allen Hamilton, and yet he had access to extraordinary amounts of information. And there are millions of people, literally, with top secret access and clearance inside the U.S. government. Um, just that alone poses a huge threat. Um, but it's not just the insider threats, as you suggest, it's also uh, foreign governments, adversary governments, it's stateless groups, it's hackers. Um, when you take that amount of sensitive information, namely our communications and the communication of the people around the world, and digitally store them in one place, you absolutely, inherently, um, are vulnerable to attack. And it can be a massive invasion of people's privacy on all kinds of levels. Now, Glenn, are there economic costs associated with the national security state, with what the NSA is doing? And is there, uh, do you have a sense of how far the NSA is willing to go to pay uh, a price under the auspices of national security? Well, there's an enormous price just in terms of the budget. Um, you know, people like to make the point that Russia and China and, and Iran um, and every other country essentially on the planet engages in electronic surveillance, and that's true, but nobody does it near to the extent of the United States, and that's just simply be a question of resources. We spend so much more on the NSA or electronic surveillance in any other country by far, billions and billions of dollars a year. So that right there is an enormous cost. But then there's the cost of when people find out that this spying is, being, is, is taking place, people will no longer trust the American tech sector. Now, here in the United States, the NSA justifies its spying, saying they're, they're essentially protecting the country from uh, those who are doing something wrong, people who have something to hide, the bad folks. And we know historically, for example, the FBI spied on civil rights activists, on Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and, and today uh, on anti-war activists and environmentalists, we see this continuing uh, as if these are people who are doing something wrong. How do you respond to that? there's two points worth making about that. Number one is when we talk about somebody doing something wrong, many different people mean very different things when they talk about someone doing something wrong. We might mean somebody who's planning an attack to blow up a building or a subway train and kill lots of civilians, but people in power tend to view 
anyone who challenges their power as doing something wrong. The other point worth making is that a surveillance state affects everybody, not just the people who are, quote, doing anything wrong, whatever we might mean by that. Just the knowledge that you might be watched or monitored means that you change your behavior in all kinds of ways. There are all kinds of psychological studies showing that people become much more conformist and cautious and afraid. Um, they make much more limited choices whenever they perceive that they might be monitored as opposed to when they believe they can act without being watched. And so a surveillance society is really a conformist society, which is why almost every government craves surveillance. Now, Glenn, does, it, does the NSA's approach to national security have the uh, opposite effect that citizens who might be afraid of landing up on a watch list might be more reluctant to actually report on real national security threats if they see something? It has a deterrent effect in, in all kinds of ways. Um, and you know, that's one of the ironies is after 9-11, the US government believed that one of the critical objectives for being able to stop terrorism and to find extremists who are actually dangerous was to work closely and in collaboration with the Muslim American community and American Muslim leaders around the country. And yet everything the US government has done over the past 13 years has been designed to do the opposite, to break any trust, to make any kind of collaboration impossible. I mean, if a community knows that the government is spying on it pervasively, that they're infiltrating it, that they perceive it as a threat, all of which the US government has done, that if you say the, even a slightly wrong thing at one point about your political views, you could get onto a radar of the government or even a watch list or be accused of terrorism, no member of that community is gonna to wanna to cooperate in any way with the US government. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how the efforts to, uh, to plant uh, surveillance mechanisms within our technology may have actually made the internet a place that's much more susceptible to actually be attacked and, and, and create greater dangers. We talk a lot in the wake of the Snowden revelations about encryption, the idea that you use certain means to protect your emails or your chats um, if you want to protect it from being monitored. But encryption is actually something that's extremely important to how the internet functions. Everybody uses encryption even though they don't know it. What the NSA has been doing is deliberately weakening those encryption protocols. They have been finding and exploiting flaws in them. They put back doors in them to enable themselves to be able to break through the encryption in, or, in order to get into it. The problem is, is that when you create a back door, even if you're comfortable with having the NSA do it, and none of us should be, but even if you are, when you create a back door into a building or into a, a, a virtual building, it's not only you that gets to enter it, it's other people, so other governments, um, stateless groups, hackers who might be a lot more malicious even, um, are able to enter that as well, or just individuals with a high level of knowledge of how the internet works. And so it makes the entire system of encryption much weaker and therefore weakens the internet as a whole. Glenn, how unprecedented is the reach of the NSA's surveillance state? Just if you look n not only at US history, but world history, that this one institution is able to pry into the lives of people the world over. Has any institution ever come even close to what the NSA is doing? The internet itself is an unprecedented tool. We do so much more on the internet and centralize so much more of our lives in one place than ever before. And if you think about what the explicit goal of the US government and their allies in this Five Eyes Alliance are, the UK, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, they explicitly say that their goal is to collect it all, to turn the internet into a place where there's literally no privacy, where every communication, every transaction, every activity is collected, stored, and then ultimately monitored when they want by these governments. And there's nothing, been nothing like the internet, and there's certainly been nothing like the level of surveillance that this kind of indiscriminate spying permits. Glenn Greenwald, thank you so much. Great to be with you, thank you. On the next episode of the Henry A. Wallace National Security Forum, author Linda Bilmes joins us to talk about just how much money we're spending on war. It will shock you. The Pentagon budget, not counting the wars, has increased by about a trillion dollars over the last decade. It is very, very difficult to actually look at the Defense Department budget. It actually has flunked its financial audit every year for the past 20 years. And it's the only department in the U.S. government that, that routinely flunks its audit. 